Romans 8, 12 to 17. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if, you, if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. You may be seated. If you recall, uh, a key verse um, that we read together that gives to us a sense of what Paul is doing um, in chapter 8 um, was back in chapter 7 and verse 6. And the last portion of that verse read this, so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not the old way of the written code. The question for us um, has been this whole time, um, how is it that those of us who are in the flesh can be able, rather, or, or those of us who have seen in us can be able to walk in a manner that is pleasing to the Lord. It was clearly shown uh, by the second portion of chapter 7 that it is impossible for us with indwelling sin to live lives that are pleasing to the Lord through the law. Chapter 8 has been the chapter of the Spirit articulating to us then what this new way of the Spirit is. The verses that we are looking at this morning uh, precisely starting from verse 14 to 17, in many ways hit the climax of that life. The life of the Spirit, or the life that we are called to that is in the Spirit, is primarily characterized as living as sons and not as slaves. We are trying to figure out what, what does it look like? What does it feel like? to live in this new way of the spirit. The heart of it, the climax of it, the height of it is that we live not as slaves, but as sons. If the Lord allows, we will be sticking around in this portion for another three sermons counting today as a fast one. We will take two um, um, runs at verse 14 to 17 um, to articulate what it looks like to live as sons and not as slaves before we go back and then walk hopefully into our very lives. That little phrase, by the Spirit, put death to your sin. This portion, verse 14 um, to verse 17, could be understood in these four um, little categories. Um, the first one is um, that this walk in the Spirit provides for us evidence that we are sons. But secondly, there's an articulation um, of the emotions that accord to sons. Thirdly, there is the experience of being sons. And lastly, there's the expectation um, that all sons possess. This morning we'll be looking at just two of those points. The first one being the evidence of sonship, and the second one being the emotions that accord to sonship. So look at that verse again, verse 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. All who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. It's critical to notice that he starts off with the word for which should cause us to look at verse 13 again. So do that with me. He told us in verse 13, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. 
But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live for. Why is it, I ask, that those who by the Spirit put to death the deeds of the body will live? Why is it that they are the ones who shall know life? Well, here's why. For those who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. Here's a point he's making to start off with a, a clarification. And I'll give you these little words for this first point. Clarification is what verse 14 starts off with serving us with. A clarification that life, life is not as a result of putting sin to death. Rather, life is as a result of being a son, which is evidenced by being led by the Spirit, which includes putting sin to death by the Spirit. You do not put sin to death so much that you end up attaining life. Rather, those who have life are sons of God. And do you know what characterizes the sons of God? Do you know what is a proof that you are a son of God? Do you know what is evidence that you are a son of God? You are led by the Spirit. It's a beautiful thing when you think about it, um, how he articulates the, the, the source of life itself. Um, life is ours because we are sons. It is fully appropriate. It's fully appropriate. Right, that life be associated with sonship, as wetness is with water or, or heat is with the sun. That's where our life comes from. It's not merely a detached gift that is given to us. That very life that we enjoy has become ours with an entirely brand new status and standing before God, and that is what sonship is. Notice the words he uses here are, are those who are led by the Spirit, led by the Spirit. Those who are sons of God are led by the Spirit. It's, it's important as we read those words to, to not misunderstand um, that little phrase to be very similar to how we engaged with the law itself. Led by the Spirit is not coerced by the Spirit. It's not coerced by the Spirit. It's, it's not those who are kind of forced to do that which they, they don't really want to do. This verse really speaks um, to us about our, our power and our potency, our, our freedom and our liberation that those who are under the law did not know anything about. The words led speak about a, 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 a being guided. Not forced towards an end you don't really want to go, but, but a being guided. A, an allowing yourself to be led by the Spirit, you see. The Spirit does that work of causing the things of God to, to be attractive to you. His, 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 his leading is, is, is his encouraging you towards the things of God. The believer is being told that those who are sons have the spirit in them. That was already made very clear in the preceding portions. Those who do not have the spirit of God do not belong to God, but all who belong to God, they have the spirit of God. And notice the work that he is now doing in us, in you and I. He is aiding us to do that which the law could never aid us to do. So that inside us, there's not just now one power, the flesh. There's another power, the spirit, encouraging us to do that which is right. You will notice with this concept here of um, our walk in the spirit or our being led by the Spirit being proof that we truly are sons and not slaves. We can, we can hear that and again hear the voice of the law condemning us 
causing us to question ourselves as to, uh, are, we, are we really sons? Is there, is there enough evidence of the Spirit working in us? The, the truth abides that though on the one hand the most sanctified of saints has enough sin inside him to damn him to eternal hell if it were not for grace. The most sanctified of saints. The best of you this morning. Leave alone you bad ones, eh? Let's select the best of you. The most sanctified of you. If you are to stand before God, you have sufficient sin inside you, apart from Christ, to damn you to eternal hell. Are we clear on that? But it is also true that the weakest of saints amongst us today, now the rest of us can come into this conversation, the weakest and the most feeble of saints this very morning has some evidence of the Spirit's work in them. And that should be greatly encouraging to us. So that if, if in this passage we are being told, right, we are being told that those who are led by the Spirit are sons of God, this truth then holds, isn't it? That there is not a one who's a true believer in whom there is no evidence of the, of the Spirit's work. So yes, even you, weak little saint, there is some evidence there yet of the Spirit's work. It's useful to think about the thief on the cross, isn't it? Like this is his last minute. He's about to die. And even in him, with his last few Minutes on the cross, there was sufficient evidence that the Spirit was at work in him with his few words, isn't it? That he sees himself as a sinner. That's the work of the Spirit, isn't it? The ministry of conviction of sins. And he sees Christ as a Savior. Enough to cause him to utter those words when you enter into heaven or paradise. Do not forget me. Please remember me. Some evidence, some evidence of the Spirit's work. And oh, saints, there's a lot of evidence of the Spirit's work in this very room this morning. So I call you to look at that little word. Look at that word. Look at that word, all. Because that is your salvation right there. You see it? It says, for all who are led. Not some who are led by the Spirit are sons of God, but rather all who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. Whether the ones led by the Spirit are the strong, mighty ones, sprinting in that last portion of their race, like our man, right, um, the 159. You finish off cheering and pumping your chest, which is not a very Christian thing, but pointing, right? And you're just like, this is superhuman. Or you are literally crawling across that finish line. Struggling, doubting, fighting, all, all of them who have any evidence of the Spirit, a conviction of sin that burdens them, that causes them to not rest in iniquity and rejoice in it and boast in it, but grieves them, brings tears to their eyes takes away joy from them, causes them in the most feeble of ways to cry out as a bruised reed, would you have mercy on me? That causes them to crawl back to the king, saying, I am not worthy, but I have no other place to go. Here I am. Would you please pardon me of my great iniquity? They don't feel great about themselves. They don't compare themselves to the great giants of the faith that we read about, that wrote the, the songs that we sing here. But guess what? They are numbered amongst the sons of God. For all, each and every single one of them who evidences the Spirit's work in them is a true son. No exceptions. Notice as well that when Paul speaks about 
us being led by the Spirit. It's not a yoking that you should think about. Again, it's this empowering that only the Lord can do. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 18 speaks about if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Think about that comparison. So the emphasis here again is, is being this is not being under that. How do you know you're not under the law and its condemnation and its judgment upon you? You're led by the Spirit. A Spirit um, comes to grant to us true freedom. He says it at the beginning of this chapter. We have been set free by the law of the Spirit of life. We have been set free. Piper has a very useful articulation of what that freedom is. He says those who want to do what is right or, or do that which is right or do something, but they have no desire to do it. They're not truly free. You're doing it, but you don't really want to do it. Whatever it is, you're not really free. You're being coerced by some other external thing. All you have is external compulsions to act or think or speak in a particular way. That's, that's not really the freedom that you're longing for here. That's not the Christian life. There's those who have a desire to do something, but do not have the ability to do it. So you want to, but no strength to. Anytime you try to, there's absolute and total failure. It's a wreck. It's a disaster. That's not true freedom. You want the desire to do something and also the power and ability to do it. But some have the desire and ability but don't have the opportunity. Even sinners. They have a desire to do certain sins. As you know, Brother Russell prayed for us this very morning. Right? Um, and yet simply no opportunity. So that if the opportunity were offered, they would happily step into it, but the opportunity is lacking. That is not true freedom. And then lastly, he adds, there's those who have the desire, the ability, and even the opportunity, but that which they do is that which ultimately destroys them, and that's not true freedom. You're basically a slave to that which is destructive to you, but the freedom that the Lord offers to us, which is a freedom that comes to us through the working of the Spirit in us, is a freedom that begins to work that desire for the things of God, even if it be, like those words of David at the beginning of Psalm 119, I really love them, because you can tell he is not the blameless man, but he is looking at the blameless man and saying, blessed, happy, happy, right, is the man who walks in the law of the Lord. That's a beautiful thing, isn't it? Like how in the universe did that become attractive to David? He's not yet there, and yet there is a desire, right, to be that. And the rest of the, of the psalm quite beautifully starts showing a, a little progression that David is making. And then in very many ways, a picture of what the Christian life um, or the life of walking with the Lord actually is. The Spirit is in us to grant to us that freedom. He is leading us, encouraging us, guiding us to that place where our desire, ability, and even opportunity will be that which accords to the things of God. Notice another little word here with this, first, with this first word, which is status. Status. Our being led by the Spirit reveals to us that we are sons of God. That little phrase, sons of God, is a pretty critical one. And it shows up in all these different important portions of the Scriptures from the beginning to the end. Let me read um, somebody smart here and what he says about Sons of God. The phrase sons of God is used in the Old Testament and Judaism to denote Israel as the people whom God has called to be his own. Correspondingly, Yahweh is pictured as Israel's father. The plural sons of God is less often applied to the people of Israel, but it occurs enough times to make it likely that Paul is thinking about that um, as his source for the little phrase sons of God. When Paul here declares to us that we are sons of God, what that primarily denotes for us is we now occupy a new status. Please notice the journey here. There's, 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 there's one, it's one thing to be told that we have been justified, that we have been forgiven, or even that we have been regenerated from death to life. That's new life. We are now born again. But we are being informed that this new standing right, that we have 
is, is characterized with this status that we have acquired, and that status is that we are the children of God. We are the sons of God. We are those who belong to him. We are uniquely and peculiarly his, and that is a high standing right, in all of creation. When you think about the genealogy in Luke chapter 3, just before um, Christ goes out into the wilderness, what's most key about that genealogy is that it identifies Adam as the son of God. That's how it wraps up. Son of, son of, son of, son of, son of, son of, son of. These verses you've all memorized, I'm sure. And then it wraps up with, and Adam, what? Son of God. That's who Adam was. Grand status as a son of God. Pinnacle of all creation. Granted, bequeath this standing by God as, as one who would, in the place of God, exercise dominion over the earth. But he loses that standing in many ways, doesn't he? Because he fails to live in accordance to that which he was, and he says, believes a lie and walks in the path of Satan. The nation Israel are bequeathed that status as well. In Hosea chapter 11 and verse 1, right? Hosea writes, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. I called my son. Speaking of Israel as those who in some ways are standing in the place of Adam. Adam was established as a son of God to live out his life in accordance with the purposes of God, in the place of God. That kind of delegated responsibility as an image bearer. But he chooses a different path. Oh, here come Israel now. They are exalted to that particular standing. But you know Israel's story. More than half of your Bible is about how they failed to walk in those ways. Romans chapter 9 verse 4, quite interestingly, will speak about Israel as, as they to whom belongs the adoption. Very interesting. So that when it comes to us, that little phrase to the Jews first, but also to the Greeks, right? It's to Israel, to them really belong that sonship. But they failed very much like, um, like Adam did. Adoption was theirs. And then comes Jesus Christ, the very son of God. And he does everything that the first Adam was unable to do. He does everything that Israel was unable to do. He keeps the law perfectly. He acts and thinks and feels. He truly is the perfect image bearer in that sense. Displays to us and reveals to us who God is. And it is because of him that we now possess that status as sons of God. We, like Adam, failed. We, like Israel, have, have failed. But because Jesus Christ comes be between us and all those other failures, we possess that status and that standing not on the basis of our performance, our not eating of the tree in the garden, our keeping the law of Moses perfectly, rather we acquire that standing as God's people on the basis of what the Son of God did. Those words that God utters about his Son are words we all long to be uttered over us. This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Church, tell me, is there someone else? Right? Can, does God say that over you? Is he able to say that over you outside of Christ? It's not possible. Like you have actually lived out the mandate that he's called you to, to the extent that God can say, you are mine. Ah, you can just sit there, isn't it? God saying that, you are my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Those saints know this that God is able to say that about us simply because we are now in Christ. And that's a status, understanding that we now possess. We belong to him. All those who are led by the Spirit in any way are submitting, yielding to the promptings, the encouragements, the workings of the Spirit in them are sons 
of God. What is secondly here? It continues and adds for us that we did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Not only is this leading by the spirit evidence that we are truly children, that we are truly sons, but we are those who have attained that coveted standing before God as those who now belong to him, who are now well-pleasing to him, who are we any evidence of the Spirit's work in us? Is evidence that we have attained that. We're told that there's also emotions that come along with this. Emotions. Please keep writing notes. I know I'm preaching to a Baptist church, and emotions are not allowed here, amen? All ye who are sound in your theology, you keep emotions far away from sound doctrine. Emotions corrupt sound theology, amen? Glad that. I need to find another trick of cueing you guys into saying amen because you've learned my tricks here. This passage speaks about an emotion called fear and says this whole being a son that is evidenced by being led by the Spirit, one of the evidences, the proofs, the way you know this is not the law, just like a Christianized version of legalism, you know, just kind of patch on top of it all of this reformed to phrases, but at the heart of it, you still end up with the same condemnation, with the same stench that is brought about by the sin that increases in the face of the law. One of the ways you know whether you're dealing with the right thing or the wrong thing is because of how it feels. It doesn't bring about fear. The leading of the spirit inside you doesn't bring about fear because the spirit's work is not, he's not the spirit of slavery pointing you back again to that time where with, with inability we were being led in accordance to fear because we were so aware of the fact that our lives and our actions fell short of that which God demanded. So the thing that characterizes that, the posture, is, is, is one who is condemned. That's not being led by the Spirit. That's not what it looks like or feels like to be a son. <laughs> to be a son instead is to walk in the adoption that the spirit effects upon our hearts, providing assurance and status of a son that leads to a corresponding action. So that the son walks in a particular way because he's being led by the spirit. But the spirit who is leading him is not a spirit of slavery so that the motivations are flowing out of intimidation, condemnation, and fearfulness. But the spirit who is leading him is a spirit of adoption as sons. Leading that individual who is being led by the spirit to utter those words, what? Abba, Father. Abba, Father. This is what it looks like to be a son. This is what it looks like to be led by the Spirit. Using those words again in chapter 7 and verse 6. This is the new way of the Spirit. What is the new of the Spirit? Living your life as a son. Here's a danger and here's why the, the, the idea of examining the emotions that drive you or inform you is so important. Because it is very easy... It's very easy for us to actually be motivated as those who are still under the law. But to pile up such right doctrine in our, on our lips that ends up deceiving us about what we have truly believed. But if we truly believe the things that are on our lips and in our heads and in our confession statements, if we truly believe them, they end up inevitably producing certain emotions. And that's not fear. Rather, it's the emotions that are in line with a son and their father. 
with a child and the father. So as Paul is instructing them here, he finds, it's all, he finds it all important to point them to their emotions and tell them, uh, 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 don't misunderstand the work of the Spirit. The work of the Spirit leads you to cry out, Abba, Father. Let me read another smart guy here that might help us. It's called Mu, and he quotes Luther. But notice a little portion that he speaks about before he quotes Luther. He says, in adopting us, God has taken no half measures. We have been made full members of the family and partakers of all the privileges belonging to members of that family. Luther comments on the believer's use of the word Abba, which is the word daddy or baba, right? Um, in Aramaic, the, like the most simple little phrases that a little child would use. Luther says this, this is but a little word and yet notwithstanding it comprehends all things. The mouth speaks not, but the affection of the heart speaks after this manner. Although I be oppressed with anguish and terror on every side and seem to be fortake, forsaken and utterly cast away from thy presence, yet I am thy child and thou art my father for Christ's sake. I am beloved because of the beloved. Wherefore, this little word, Father, conceived effectually in the heart, passes all the eloquence of Demosthenes and Cicero, and the most eloquent of those who speak rhetoric that ever were in the world. He utters quite, for us quite clearly that the, the idea of sonship is not only grasped with understanding the status we now possess as those who are truly God's people, like Adam was in the garden, like Israel in that sense, a status that is ours, we are his, but there's also an aspect of the heart of a son, not just merely the status of a son. And that heart of a son is not characterized with fear like that of a slave. That heart of a son has all the corresponding emotions that are in line of fitting for a son with the parent or a child with the father. Gladness, confidence, our safety and security, acceptance, our unquestioned belongingness in the presence of the father, our joy and peace, admiration and adoration, our reverence and rest, these are the emotions of a son in the presence of a father, of a child in the presence of their father. Not fear. Not fear. You, you, see, you see, Paul in this very verse introduces this new little word, adoption. The spirit of adoption. Do you notice that again throughout this entire portion? There's the, there's the sonship that is ours, but you see how the spirit is all over the place, right? The spirit, the spirit, the spirit. That's why, again, we're speaking about uh, chapter 7 and verse 6, the way we are. We are not getting what it is to walk in the spirit, be led by the spirit, this new way of the spirit, until we grasp sonship. Because the spirit is the spirit of what? Adoption, you see. The spirit of adoption. Being granted the full rights and privileges of sonship in a family to which one does not belong to by nature. You've been adopted into that family. You know, it's interesting that in the, in the Bible, when you look at the, from the beginning to the end, there's this tracing of two seeds, if you so please. All the way from Eve, right, um, and Satan, the curse when it's meted out, what God says is that, I will put enmity between your seed and her seed. And there's a seed that will come from Eve who will crush the head of the serpent. And in the scriptures, there's just very clearly two lines. And, and a portion you should really study for yourself is John and chapter 8, when Jesus is speaking to those who, I will use my phrase from last week, have satanic assurance. A satanic assurance that causes them to ignore 
The way in which they are wallowing in sin, reveling in sin, have made peace with sin, and they are boasting and said, we are the sons of who? Abraham. We are the sons of Abraham. We have Abraham for our father. They are claiming to be on this side of that lineage, isn't it? There's the wicked and the righteous, Psalm 1. We are the righteous. Why? Because we are the children of Abraham. He is our father. And Jesus articulates to them, no, Abraham is not your father. Really, the devil is your father. You're speaking lies because he's the father of lies. And your conduct is showing quite clearly who your father is. And that's not my God. You are rejecting me, the one who has been sent by that very same God. This is not what it looks like if you're so pleased to be led by the Spirit. Two lines clearly show us that we are those who have been invited to come from one family to another. From one family to another. We will be recognized as genuine children in the family of God. We who are genuine children, if you so please, in the family of the enemy of God. We were running about in sin along with the sons of wrath in this world. But what conversion has done for us is it's not only pardoned us and justified us, it has invited us into a new family. And in this new family, we don't walk in and are very aware of the place where we came from, so we remain at the door. We, we, we say, well, I know that it's such a privilege for me to simply be here and not be in hell, you see. Because I know that's what I deserve for my sin. I deserve the eternal condemnation of God. No, we're being told it's a step further into the house of God. You're welcomed in from the wrath that is being poured outside there, but you're welcomed in as a son, as one who has full rights and standing as a child in that room. You're welcomed to that very table. You belong there. That scandalous assurance that is being offered to us. Notice as well that it says sons and not daughters. Now don't leave, don't leave. There's been a heavy complementarianism week over here. It's quite important that it says sons and not daughters. You notice it says later on it speaks about children. It speaks about sons and then children. Children clearly include sons and daughters, right? And, and yet the, the reason why it's critical that he speaks about sons in this culture and context, very much like the African culture, right, at least back in the day, were sons and daughters equal in the African culture? No, not in the African culture. Before God, there's like no question about that, right? He has made us in his image. So it's that simple. He has made us in his image. A man and a woman are clearly equal in his sight. They are image bearers. In fact, in many ways, I believe the understanding of 126 of Genesis is that if the world was only filled with men or only filled with women, we would not be displaying his image as clearly. But it says that he made man in his image, male and female, he made them. So that actually we, in the diversity in this room as male and female, most clearly demonstrate the image of God. In the prophetic books, right, there's places where God speaks about himself, but compares himself and his love to the love of a mother. You know what that says about our love as fathers? I personally really love my children. But it's like for us to understand the tenderness with which he loves his children, guess who he speaks about? Right? He doesn't speak about the father. That's a different kind of image. All this to say we are image bearers. But notice, the people is writing to exist in a particular culture. And in that very culture, the ideas are, oh, a son who gets to go to school if you only are able to pay school fees for one child. The son does. When is the dad most proud? The son, the son, the son, the son, the son. So what a good thing it is that the whole church is being told in that culture, you are all what? You're all sons. In God's eyes, he's not saying daughters are less or sons are more. No, he's saying in my eyes, I only have sons in that sense. My daughters and my sons are all one. I value them equally. 
There is not a one who is worth more, even a little bit, than the other simply because of their gender. Galatians will speak about it in the same way, saying that basically in the church there is no Greek, no Jew, right, or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. Why? Because in the eyes of God we have all become sons. Make sure I catch that before we um, exit this portion. He loves us. He exalts us. He is proud of us. He elevates us. He treasures us. A question though I'm asking you then is one, have you grasped the status that is now yours as a son of God? Do you marvel at it? That you who are afar off not deserving anything from God, you have been welcomed home. And that the way in which you have been welcomed home is not a, a, a manner where all of your past and former sins still kind of define you and even in the house of God categorize you. But rather you have all been welcomed to the house of God and been bequeathed with this status you are sons of God. You belong to me. You are those who I am putting at the pinnacle of all of my plans for this world. In the way in which I will display my goodness and my glory. I return back to Eden and then some. I return back to that status lost either by Israel and all of their failings or by Adam and Eve and their failings. And us returning to that place because of what the Son of God, Jesus Christ, did in our place. Have you meditated on the glories of chapter 5, which were just ridiculous, where we were being told that we have been reconciled? There was enmity between us and God before because of our sins. But God has demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were enemies, Christ died for us so that we can be reconciled back to God again. But did you notice just how chapter 8 amps all of that up? It's not just merely that we were enemies and now we have been reconciled. We were enemies and now we have been made sons. The love that flows out of the Father's heart is that which now belongs to us. And listen to this, your little doubting heart, because it's so puny, it doesn't have sufficient faith. It has the aid of the Spirit. The Spirit is at work in your soul to help you grasp this is how you relate to God. So that when there's fear growing in your heart towards God, please did you know this? That's not the Spirit working. Are we clear on this? That's not the Spirit working. That's, that's what the Spirit produces in the hearts of sons. The Spirit who leads us to repentance leads us to look to God for our salvation, is the same spirit who tells that fear to hush it. Because we are children and not slaves. Even when the Father disciplines us, we don't swing and oscillate all the way back again to the fear of a slave. He disciplines us with the love of a father, doesn't he? The discipline of the father to the son is not the pouring out of his wrath because he already poured out his wrath upon his son. That was emptied all out. The discipline of a father to a son, our father to us as his sons, is the discipline of one who is seeking to encourage us down that path of life and peace. The way in which we even fear the father's discipline is not the same way in which we fear the wrath of a slave owner. The way in which my little daughter will fear my discipline will not be the same way I will fear the, the, the wrath of a terrorist or a, or a thief. It's not the same. So that my little girl right now, almost turning three in a couple of months, when I discipline her, I discipline her, once I'm done, she stretches out her little pinky at me to kiss it and blow on it and express to her affection and care. I just punished her. And yet she's looking right back at me again, totally guaranteed whoever this guy is, whoever this guy is, 
This is my father, and this is the same place where I will look to for comfort and care, reassurance, and reaffirmation. It's right here. He doesn't now despise me and hate me because I broke a glass. Get out of my house. You're no longer my daughter. No. You're my child. And a couple of minutes afterwards, we are most probably rolling on the ground or playing and laughing again. That's a lot because of her, not of me. <laughs> this is what it means to be a child. We do not dare misunderstand the status and the heart of being a child which the Spirit works in us. Listen to this other wise man speaking and see if you can catch yourself inside here. He says, although claiming my true identity as a child of God, I still live as though the God to whom I am returning demands an explanation. I still think about his love as conditional and about home as a place I am not yet fully sure of. While walking home, I keep entertaining doubts and, and uh, entertaining doubts and whether I will be truly welcome when I get there. As I look at my spiritual journey, my long and fatiguing trip home, I see how full it is of guilt about the past and worries about the future. I realize my failures and know that I have lost the dignity of my sonship. But I am not yet able to fully believe that where my failings are great, grace is always greater. Still clinging to my sense of worthlessness, I project for myself a place far below that which belongs to the sun. Speaking of any of us here this morning, grasp the truths here. But in reality, we see ourselves as worthless. We continue even after confessing our sins to walk in accordance to that guilt and shame that came from our former sins. Theology is right, but our posture and our relating to God clearly isn't. Do you know why? Let me tell you why I'm preaching the by the Spirit put sins, but put death to your sins, right? Last of all. Because if we got into the heart of it, we just kind of replace by the Spirit with by the law. And in reality, the ideas of by the Spirit putting sin to death mean all the things that the Spirit is teaching us here, whispering to our hearts, you are a son, you are a son, not a slave. The emotion that is actually dictating or defining your relationship to God is all important if you are going to, by the Spirit, put sin to death. Because the call to sanctification that the Lord invites us to is not just to grit your teeth, say never again, and then step into it. If it is by the Spirit, please note this, the Spirit who leads us in putting sin to death is the Spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. So, so there's no getting sanctification and my pressing on towards maturity without immersing myself in this incredulous truth that I'm a son. That's the height of it, isn't it? Not merely I've been forgiven. I've been justified. I have been reconciled. All of those things are the road towards I am a son. Because listen to this, there is no higher status in God's creation. None. And that's what we have now become in Christ. So questions for you as we wrap up. Who and what do you still fear? If we cling to that idea of fear, what does, a, what does your fear tell you about what you really believe? All I have is wise people up here this morning. Ed T. Welch writes a book when people are big and God is small. And, and he asks a couple of questions. Do you fear that people will see you as you truly are? Do you fear that people will see you as you truly are? Is that the fear that is in your heart? Do you know where the word fear was first mentioned? You know this because you all know your Bibles very well. 
all the way back in chapter 3 of Genesis. They sinned, and immediately what happened? They were afraid. They hid behind bushes, and they used leaves to cover their shame and their guilt in their fear. Are you controlled and owned by that fear still? Is that where you are? It says something about you of not understanding the truth that you're a son. These truths are telling you that every single cause you had to hide behind the bush and hide yourself have been addressed by the coming of the Son of God. So that the one who covers you now is not yourself, is not your secrecy, is not that people don't really know who you are, but rather the blood of the Lamb. In Christ, those who are in Christ have no cause to be afraid before God. And if they have no cause to be afraid before God, they have no cause to be afraid before man. Do you fear people will see you as you truly are? Is that the fear that ends up controlling you then? If I fear that about people, clearly shows us things are not dealt with as far as God goes. Still holding on to a righteousness that I have attained by my own works. Happy to talk about the gospel and happy to talk about grace. Up to a particular point, I kind of want to earn the rest of it myself. Amen? So that even though I stand speaking about Jesus... I am less like the prostitute who was on her knees washing Christ's feet with her tears and wiping them with her hair. I have utterly nothing to boast about. And I want to be more like whatever images we have from YouTube or from the books we read about our Christian heroes. A, 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 a cleaned up version of that. So that in our heart of hearts, we are a little bit more like the firstborn son, the righteous one who never left home, than we are like the prodigal son who comes back and he says, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your servants. And what does the father do? You know what the father does. Embraces him, kisses him, takes his robe, places it on him, takes out his ring, puts it on his finger, and he says, slaughter the fattened calf. Tonight it's going to be a party, for my son was lost, and he is now found. And we are told that's how heaven rejoices, good people. Not about the firstborn son who never left, but the one who is clearly God's son because of God's love and mercy and grace. Is that where we are? Or do we rather be the firstborn son who remained at home, but still get the gospel very clearly. Fears that people will reject you if they know who you truly are. If they really get who you really are. If they really see the ugliness in you. Like, like if we just removed the veneer of wearing your Sunday best. And they really got to hear your story. As it truly is. Not as we see each other here, but as it truly is, a fear of rejection. Marvel, people. Marvel. Marvel that this church is God's church. And even though we come cloaked in tons of hypocrisy still, that kind of make us pretend we are something more than we really are, we need not fear because God has not received us into his sonship on the basis of our appearances or on the basis of other people's opinions about us. The God who has seen all of our ugliness, all of our failures, all of our shortcomings has sent his son and it is only in his son, only in his son that we have become sons. There's no right we possess before God. No standing, no privilege, no hope, no treasure that is outside the sonship that has been granted to us purely by grace. And the Lord has poured out his spirit upon us as, as his church to work that truth further in us. Further in us. 
Your emotions towards God reveal what you truly believe about God, far more than your doctrinal statement does. So can I ask you to do an inventory about your own heart? Would you examine clearly what it is that shows you don't really believe you have become a son and that God is your father? Maybe it's in how you pray. Maybe it's in how you pray. And you don't quite talk to your father like one who loves you. Like, you know how fathers operate, right? Like the smallest little thing, we are out there trumpeting. My child is a genius. She's a total genius, you know? She can say A to C all by herself. Oh, come all ye and behold, the genius little one in my home. You take this little and you just magnify it. What an artist my child is. You stick their pictures on your fridges and in the office and they're, in all honesty, horrendous looking pictures. <laughs> but it's my son, it's my child. That's a father. And yet maybe we come even in prayer with all this intimidation of, I have to understand all of the theology of Zephaniah for me to talk to my father. Listen, you know what the Bible is teaching you? That's not impressive to God. That is not impressive to God. Do you know, it is way more glorifying to God when in simplicity and confidence and assurance you walk into his presence because you're a child and you don't treat him like this harsh, mean judge examining every single word and checking out whether all the theology is fully in line with absolutely everything else that is said. The heart posture really reveals whether we know him as our father and know how much we yet need to learn so that our theology should be aiding us in living out our sonship. Our theology should not be replacing our sonship, covering up for our sonship. I feel insecure, not confident, all of these things, ashamed, and I keep upping and upping and upping my, my rhetoric. The most beautiful community is that of those who in humility have been accepted home and are just happy under the fatherhood of God. They are confident, not in themselves, but in God. They rest, they trust. Are oh, there something there for us to pursue, isn't there, church? Something there for us to pursue? Something attractive about that? I'll wrap up with this Keller quote. It's a quote I've said before. He says that the only person who dares wake up a king at 3 a.m. for a glass of water is a child. And he wraps up by saying that's the kind of access we have. Church, this is our father, and he has loved us through his son. I pray that this very morning the work of the Spirit in us will not be resisted by you, but will be a work that will lead you in repentance to arms that are stretched wide to welcome you back to him again. That you will not come crawling, doubting his fatherhood, his kindness, his generosity, and his grace. But that as a church this morning, we will be those who will run into his arms and receive mercy and forgiveness. Because that's what, that's what he offers us as his children.